Tell me your story. Tell me your story. How did it all start? Do you remember? Oh, I know what happened. How did it start? This is Small Business Origins. Yeah, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Small Business Origins. You're tuned in to our nationwide search. We're looking for entrepreneurs that have a story to tell. And I know I've said this before on episodes in the past, but we're going to have to change this intro to worldwide search because, you know, having people come in from Canada, uh, having listeners that are all over the world as well, and then now having a guest come on from Sydney, Australia, joining me virtually in the studio. I've got Nathan Kassar with Nathan Kassar Master of Ceremonies. Nathan, welcome to the show, man. Mate, it's great to be here. I, uh, I I love the intro, by the way. I'm a sucker for uh, for a great intro. It's, it's like literally a big part of what I do in terms of like the high energy intro. So I was just like, I was like jamming. I was like, oh my God. I'm so Absolutely. Jealous. Dude, that's why I play it every single episode. Like I don't have to play the intro at all. We could just totally start talking, record, <laughs> just have this thing go. But I've said it before. There's something about that intro that just like gets you pumped, ready to go. So I love to hear it before I kick off the show. And, you know, I love it. So I want to show it off to the guests and have them hear it as well. If they've never listened to an episode of the show and what better way than to just pop that thing off and then start going. You're right. It is high energy. Just gets you in the mood to podcast, man. I want to hop into it because we've already started talking backstage prior to getting this thing rolling And I know this is going to be an interesting episode, but we always start out with an icebreaker question. So today's icebreaker question is, would you rather be able to see through material things like walls and doors or figurative things like lies or empty promises? Oh, Oh, I think that's kind of an easy one, to be honest. I think the latter, uh, being able to see through lies, because obviously we can't read minds and so forth, but that would be an amazing thing. Whereas like, if I wanted to see behind a door, I could just like, open the door <laughs> if I was right? really yeah. curious I guess yeah so uh yeah I think the I think particularly in my line of work too it'd be great to have that extra supernatural level of being able to reach uh, to read people as well uh, rather than just my own intuition at the moment so definitely number two heck yeah no I'm <clears throat> I'm the same way man I was sitting here thinking about it you know what my answer was going to be I try to research the icebreaker questions just prior to the show so that mm. I'm also not, you know, having all of this time to research it and think about it. But I'm the same way. Like, it'd be kind of cool to be able to see through walls and stuff for certain purposes. But also that could be really creepy. So I'm like, you know (laughs) what? Beyond that, I mean, being able to have that ability to know if someone's lying to you or giving you an empty promise or if it's a real promise, like being able to truly know what they're thinking. I, I do see it as kind of like a mind reading thing, like you said. I don't know if you ever saw the, I think it was a Mel Gibson flick called What Women Want. Oh, yeah. Yes. I was a kid when it came out, but yeah. I mean, same. I was too. But, you know, back in the day when I was growing up, I lived out in the country. So we'd go outside and play or we would be in the pool. And then at night, you know, we didn't have internet like we do today. We didn't have all of these things where you can stream and, you know, do all this different stuff. The video games were fun, but they were limited. (laughs) So it was watching those old VHS tapes, man, popping them in. And my mom had a library of VHS tapes. And I would just sit there for hours and hours every single night watching movies. And what women want, it was just so funny to me because I was like, it's something that we always think that we want to be able to do, to know what somebody (laughs) wants, to know what's going to please them, or on the contrary, to know the very truth about what people think about you. I think most of us probably agree you know, the first thought we have is I really don't want to know what people think about me, but uh, I'm somebody that I absolutely want to know. I want to know what it is. That way I can anticipate it, correct it if I'm wrong or cut that person from my life because they're not a good person if they have certain thoughts about me. So yeah, definitely. I want to see through figurative things. Yeah. Now it's funny actually how, how this all really ties into sort of what I do <laughs> as a business, obviously like not as intense as perhaps as having to know everyone's deepest, darkest, and darkest desires, but certainly uh, a great metaphor into, to sort of like, and, and, and relates very well into a sort of what I do on my day to day to be successful at what I am as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure that it could play into it a hundred percent for all of us, honestly, no matter mm. what business we're in knowing someone's true intentions without them knowing, you know, definitely could give you a leg up. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> well, before we kick it off and get started, man, I always have to stop and take a second to talk about our sponsors. And today's sponsor 
They want to let you know that if you're tired of juggling multiple platforms for your marketing and sales needs, it's time to revolutionize your business operations with Wingman. Wingman's an all-in-one marketing automation software. It's designed by experienced marketers who understand your struggles. It's a game changer. It combines the best tools to streamline your communication, automate your workflows, and grow your business. You can capture leads using landing pages, surveys, forms, and more. You can nurture them with personalized messages via voicemail, SMS, emails, and even Facebook Messenger. You can close deals with built-in tools to collect payments, schedule appointments, and track analytics. Say goodbye to multiple marketing tools and hello to Wingman, your unified platform for all of your business needs. Enhance your online presence, manage your reputation effectively, and cultivate leads effortlessly. If you're ready to take your business to new heights, visit TrustYourWingman.com today and let Wingman be your co-pilot to success because every business needs a Wingman. But Nathan, we're here to talk about you. The same question I ask every single person on this show is, who are you? Where'd you come from? What is your origin story, man? How'd you get into entrepreneurship? Yeah, so it's a, it's quite the story. It starts um, when I was much younger and uh, I had a I found I had a desire to become an entertainer. And it was sparked from when I was 14. I went on my very first cruise, uh, I, here in Sydney, Australia, where I'm born. And, uh, it was, it was, you got to imagine the fact that I was a very introverted child. I was bullied a lot as a, as a kid. So I'm a very different person than I am today. I'm still, I'm, in some way, like I'm, I'm, I'm just the best version of myself now. I was able to find myself many years on, but. When I was younger, you know, I was my, my, uh, I was very sort of suppressed in the, in the playground, you know, but people found any kind of way to, to sort of really tell me how to feel. And I sort of dug into that for a very long time. When I went on this cruise though, it completely changed everything because what it did was that the environment on board really showed me that there was another new world that I could discover. And it helped unlock sort of those pieces of me that I had sort of locked away because out of fear of showing who I really was to people and, you know, my desire just to be friendly and to, to get to know people was, and to be out there was uh, certainly pushed down over those many years as a kid. So uh, I had at the time, uh, being, just had started public speaking as well because it was something that I had actually really forced myself to want to do. I just had this innate desire to want to be one of the best public speakers. And it was so antithetical to like the fact that it was on stage and it was in front of people and all this kind of stuff. So when I went on this cruise and I saw the cruise director and I saw the cruise staff and just everything was, was just so like enigmatic and exciting. And it was just, it was for me, it was just, I, I was like, wow, I have to do this one day. I have to be that guy, but be so much better than him. And so I kept the dream alive and uh, went on my next cruise when I was 20 and just uh, got off that ship as well. And just ever all my, all my friends were like, oh my God, I can totally see you doing that. I actually had this really amazing conversation with one of the crew staff from Canada. I'll never forget it. She sat down with me one night and I'd explained, you know, a bit of, a bit of my so same thing I'm doing here is that I told my origin story at that point. And she said, you know, I said, look, I got to ask the question, like, well, how do, how do I get this job? And she explained everything. And she really, really took the time to inspire me. The funny thing is, is that as soon as she left that immediate moment, the cruise director of that particular cruise came over and I asked him the same question. And he showed me exactly how not to be a good cruise director because he essentially put me down and said, oh, mate, nah, you've, uh, you've, <laughs> good luck, you know, with your kind of background, you know, you know it's, it's a bit of a hard job to get. So I was like, oh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. So uh, a couple of years later, I still kept the dream alive. I was in university finishing up my final uh, month of, uh, sorry, for my final semester, I should say, of university, of my marketing degree, my philosophy degree. And uh, I, I said, look, this is basically it. If I, you know, I have to sort of how marry this. If I don't apply, I'll regret for the rest of my life. And so I applied a couple of times. One was to be too early in the August of that year. And then I applied again in October for, uh, with the recruitment agency in, in Brisbane for uh, Princess as a junior assistant cruise director. And I managed to get it. And so I was on, I joined the Grand Princess in Los Angeles and San Pedro Port. I'm sure many of you listeners are familiar with that port uh, on January 3rd, 2015. And that began uh, the pretty much that was sort of my Batman story in the sense that I was on board for three and a half years as a junior assistant cruise director, moved to the assistant cruise director role. And then I had caught the attention of the head office. So I was asked to go into a very specific new role 
known as the fleet supervisor of entertainment experience. And I moved from an onboard or full-time entertainment job to now setting the legacy, setting standard operating procedures, performance audit training. And the biggest part of my job was to create headline game shows for the entire Princess Cruises fleet. So I went from just sort of six months on board to flying all around the world to all of our 17 ships at the time. I created some of the biggest game shows that uh, your listeners can go onto any cruise in the Princess fleet now and see, uh, particularly the uh, the high seas heist, uh, which is uh, Joe Kenda is an old, is a retired Colorado Department police detective, and he's actually known on Investigation Discovery on the t- on the the cable show, and so he was partnered with us to do this crime mystery on board one of my headline shows, and I also created the Can You Survive game show as well which is sort of like a combination between 60 second frenzy sort of minute to win it and uh, trivia. And it's a uh, regionally separated and it's a lot of fun. And I highly recommend it's been re-rolled out throughout the fleet. Now I highly recommend your listeners go and check it out. Uh, but amongst all of that, obviously we all know the big C came along COVID and uh, uh, really smashed our industry more than the majority of industries around the world. So it then a bit of soul searching happened. I was listening, I was living in LA at the time, uh, with my then wife, not anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, we, uh, I was living in LA, uh, with her and like, <laughs> what a fun year to live in LA, right? 2020. And so, uh, unfortunately, when, uh, things we caught a quits at the beginning of 21, I returned home. That actually ended up being the best thing that possibly could have happened to me for, well, for, <laughs> bunch of reasons. But uh, the biggest one, entrepreneurially speaking, was that it gave me the opportunity to be a part of my brother's wedding uh, in April 2021. And it was there where I hosted the wedding, I emceed the wedding, and uh, I had a bunch of people I'd never met before from his side of the family because I've been, sorry, from her side of the family, uh, my sister-in-law, because I hadn't been home for, you know, who knows how many years, I think it was like six or seven years by that point, not very often anyway. So by the end of the night, I had a bunch of people saying, oh my God, please do this as a job. You got to do this as a job. I'm like, well, what do you think I've been for like seven years? And I'm like, I've been, I've been entertainers, but what I do for a living. And they're like, oh no, but like, you know, start this business here, get a be an MC, get a business card, get a website. Okay, fine. So like two weeks later, I did all of that. And uh, I did six weddings and four corporate events in 2021, uh, rudely interrupted with a, a significant five month lockdown that we had in the end of 2021. Um, uh, which was quite brutal and yeah, it was, it was tough to get through, but I made a choice actually at the end of that year to say goodbye to princess, at least for the time being and pursue this job. Well, I only had like four contracts with couples and no corporate events on the list. And I just thought I knew deep in my heart. I was like, I have to pursue this. I'm stickler for seeing my word through anyway. I'm not going to break these contracts, but certainly I'm definitely going to actually, I'm, I just know there's something in it for me here. And yes, yeah, so I said goodbye. One of the, it was the hardest. It was actually the hardest day of my life that year. Not, uh, not the end of the marriage part. Uh, but then, uh, once, um, uh, once 2021, finished off and we came out of lockdown 2022 saw 86 events in total with 50 weddings and uh, just under 40 corporate events so and a whole bunch of uh, small trivia events in between weekly so it is a, a whirlwind experience and uh is, is now culminated into several industry awards within the the wedding industry uh so here in australia so i'm really thrilled uh, that uh in 2023 has already been a really successful year uh a, a tougher year economically economically speaking, a lot of challenges that go along with uh, the current economic climate, but particularly for for some, a niche like mine where I'm one of the only full-time MCs in the industry. Uh, so I, li- I obviously rely upon getting gigs constantly, but um, it's it's definitely been a whirlwind experience that I will never take back and never would, wouldn't trade anything for the world. So uh, and I'm just grateful to be here today to be able to tell my story. Yeah, dude, I mean, thanks for sharing it. You know, cruising is something that has always been near and dear to my heart. And I got to tell you, if I wasn't a married man with three kids, cruising (laughs) is probably something I could do for a living. Uh, I absolutely love it. I think it's so much fun. You know, I've met so many people on those ships that are staff that I'm friends with to this day outside of Carnival has been the big one that we cruise with. Uh, So. Yes, out of Galveston. And that has been we're trying to book something right now because the last cruise we took was actually in January of 2020. Oh, wow. You need to go. So (laughs) as we were returning, 
literally as we're returning in Galveston, they had a shipwreck and uh, it was a small vessel and oh, wow. they were basically trying to recover a lot of stuff. So they shut the port down for like, I don't know, three or four hours. And so the cruise director got on and let us know, hey, we're just kind of sitting here with a whole lot of other ships, just waiting for them to open the port back up and move in and take our place. And until then, you know, enjoy breakfast, enjoy probably lunch, and you can watch TV in the cabin and, you know, kind of move around. Obviously, the casino shut down. It's not really a whole lot of fun when you're waiting to, yeah. to get back. But I was like, hey, you know what? I get to sleep in for another three or four hours. I'm mm. totally fine with this. So we're watching the news and, you know, they're talking about all these different worldwide things that are occurring. And one of them was this new virus that they have found in China called coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just like every other major thing that we've had, that's going to like destroy us and our planet. And then it fizzles into nothing. My wife and I were like, Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Probably going to be nothing. Oh, well, not knowing we were on our very last cruise for several years because as you know, with your industry, unfortunately, or your prior industry, it was just, it was shut down for so long. And then when they came back, they were requiring vaccinations and, mm. you know, all of these hoops you had to jump through. We had zero interest in partaking in any of it. I truly thought I would never cruise again. Mm. And so my wife and I are definitely trying to get our cruise scheduled. Like right now we were talking about it. We've got to get one on the books because it's something we used to do all the time, mm. but meeting those people, you know, there are so many genuine good people on those ships from across the world and you can establish some great friendships. And, you know, some of them, a, a very well-known uh, cruise director in the carnival space right now, it, they call him Cookie, but Jonathan Adams, he's from Houston, Texas, just like I am, mm. ran into him being an idiot who was drinking as soon as I got on the ship and already feeling good and, you know, talking about where the hot dogs were for our mustard station and <laughs> it's all of those corny dad jokes that every dad who's ever drank on a cruise has made. And uh, at first he was super annoyed with me. And then it just turned into, we kept, obviously, as you know, with the entertainment staff, their yeah. whole point is to be in your face all the time and make you have fun. So mm -hmm. we saw him over and over and over again. We found out that we all really got along quite well and, and we've established a relationship even outside of cruising, you know, and it's, yeah. It's such a fun position to be able to talk to people and meet new people. And even as a, a, a patron, you know, someone who's on that ship cruising, it's nice to talk to these people who are always so open about where they came from, what life is like in their home country, why they're working in the cruise industry, you know, and you learn all the trade secrets about the, uh, you know, the secret bars and restaurants and all that stuff that exists for the crew and the quarters, man, it is just, it's something I think I could do, just not staying away from my family for that long. I couldn't yeah. be away from my kids now. I've definitely heard that, uh, that, that, that exact thing you just said many, many times when I was working abroad and, uh, and even beyond, uh, my time on ships. It's, uh, it's definitely an alluring experience that I was very grateful to have been welcomed into. It's a world that transforms you and it really does craft you in a way that it's, there's a 5% that I can never really ever get across the board to people. I could sit here and do, I could do seminars and keynote speeches about it. I could try to set up diagrams and slideshows and everything else and show you photos and videos and everything else. But there is just that 5% that really can never be translated to someone else that unless of course you're within the industry. It's funny when I, um, when I was having a, I had a wedding recently that, uh, I was, uh, my daughter, I usually get a lot of compliments during like my entrance and stuff because like speaking of big intros and so forth, my, my intros to weddings are not small. And so I, I it's funny, like I did the intro and everyone's having a great time and, and all sort of simmered down. We'll get to the food and all that kind of stuff waiting for the next thing to happen. And, uh, I, I had someone call me over and I said, oh, yeah. and she goes, they go, you, you were a cruise director back in the day, weren't you? And I said, yeah, and I've had that before. People just call it out straight away or say something. Most often they'll say like, oh, you should do cruises. And I go, well, I've got a story for you. Um, <laughs> and then uh, and then she, go, well, she goes, well, actually, you know, I used to be cruise staff on Disney. And I was like, oh, my God. Australia, we don't meet a lot of people in the wild that have been from ships, just because, particularly from the entertainment staff, just because it's not a very common job to do here. Um, there's actually more American cruise 
staff, a like crew going to see than there are in people from Australia, which is kind of weird because we love to travel. So you'd think it'd be something that like we would actually pick up, but it's not really a common career here. So when meeting someone in the wild like this, I was at a wedding, I'm like, oh my God. So half the night we're just chatting away about like, the difference. Like I'm aware of, you know, things at Disney and stuff and she's aware of other things, but there's, there's, there's intangible like sort of similarities and, 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 and parallels that can't be changed between the cruise industry that it's just really nice to reflect upon. So it was, it's, it's a, it's a kindred spirit in the, in the world when you meet someone, you know, but also too, I just love meeting people like yourself who are so passionate about cruising because it's been a big part of my life. It's been a big part of my entrepreneur journey. It's, it taught me how to, to stand on my own two feet, how to, I found my, my, my stage presence by, by my craft. I made a lot of mistakes when I was on ships, you know, I've said, you know, I've said things that I shouldn't have said and da, 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 but you know, you, you, you get told, nope, that's wrong. Do it this way. And you put it into practice. And eventually over the course of three and a half years, you know, I found myself really being able to, I just found myself being, being capable of, uh, you know, finding where I needed to be and where I fit in to the entertainment industry. And now I've been able to translate that now out to the domestic market here in Australia, uh, as a major point of difference compared to the rest of my competitors. I, I know that I sit very, very different compared to them just because of my cruise ship background and my ability to be able to connect with an audience on a much deeper level and a much wider level at the same time, because that's what cruise ships do. They throw into the deep end and say, connect, look people in the eye and make everyone fall in love with you as much as possible. And I'm really grateful that the cruise ship industry gave me that and gave me that opportunity. And then of course, gave me the opportunity to set a legacy in my corporate role as well. So uh, I've always, always got time for people who love cruises because uh, that's, that's just been a big part of my life. Yep. I, I love my land vacations, but cruising is just such an easy way to always have plenty of entertaining things to do on sea days. And then whenever you get to a port, yeah, you're not getting to spend, you know, a week long there or three or four days there, but long enough that you get to enjoy some of the highlights of that area, because we're ones that we don't really do a lot of the regular excursions. We may do one while we're there, but we're adding in, you know, hey, taxi driver, take me to the real parts of where we're visiting. <laughs> like, I don't want to go to the tourist parts where I'm going to buy a bunch of stuff made in China. Take me where there's actual things that are made here from your country. There's actual food I can try because, you know, we're big travel fans. So I want to come somewhere and experience your culture. I don't want to come there and buy some cheap toy that is literally ordered from China and then sold there at the port. I want to actually enjoy your country and see the differences between us, the similarities, because like you said, it's it's so easy for us, whether you're talking about two cruise directors or an American and an Australian or, you know, anybody else, we can always find similarities in our life or in our careers mm. or what we do. So I know obviously like most people, you know, COVID had a huge effect on you and kind of pushed you towards this, you know, career change, life change, everything kind of being totally different for you. Mm. What was the, the first thing that you really had to do to figure out you wanted to be an entrepreneur and figure out this was what you wanted to do. You know, how do you build that? How do you build becoming a master of ceremonies? Yeah. So it's, it, it, there was some parts of it was self-driven and self-understood from my, you know, my, my network that was still like, a couple of, couple of strings I was able to pull when I was back here. I had, uh, you know, obviously I had my marketing degree from, from the time. So I had some business acumen that obviously I'd built, uh, through my time at corporate and so forth. And so my, you know, my general entrepreneurial spirit was there and I had a couple of mentors here that were able to guide me through the process, but there were some things that kind of forced me in this direction too. One thing that I discovered, uh, which will probably come to a shock to a lot of, a lot of listeners, but, um, in Australia, we're not as loose or as laid back as some people love to think of us. Those of uh, those in the audience who are probably, you know, of the Gen X and beyond sort of, um, uh, generation, they, they're obviously akin to like, you know, the, the, the Paul Hogan, you know, the shrimp on the Barbie, you know, uh, campaigns, good day USA, all that kind of stuff that was really popular back in the eighties and early nineties. And, uh, when I was just being born. And so, uh, that, that gave this impression that Australia was this you know, really loose and fast kind of country that just, you know, was always partying, drinking, everything else like that, and just doesn't care. It's all very happy-go-lucky. Not the case. 
I, especially when it comes to, uh, to the corporate business environment. And how I learned this was I, when I came home, I thought I had a stellar resume. Fourth largest cruise line in the world, remote, uh, junior super, uh, junior management experience, uh, working across international waters, um, you know, with, with international experience, with a wide oversight of, of, um, Various, uh, parts of the, of, of the major entertainment department at, at, and, you know, responsible for revenue generation to, uh, experiential design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thought they were all beautiful, uh, 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 relatable, um, uh, skills that I could, you know, utilize. No, I submitted about 50 cover letters and resumes in the space of three months. And I know some people are, oh, you just didn't try hard enough. But here's the thing. I never got a single callback once. And I learned very quickly that Australia actually doesn't like foreign work experience, particularly not at the level that I was talking at and I had, which was really heartbreaking because I had really wanted, you know, 100% for my country to embrace the fact that I returned home. But unfortunately, when it came to getting a job and continuing to, to contribute back and to set up a new life, I was denied that. At least I would have been denied that for a much longer period of time had I continued to pursue the general normal, I want to be an employee, go back to being, you know, employer-employee relationship. So when my brother's wedding came along, it just said to me, you know what, I'm just over filling these applications out when I know that I have the ability and the desire and um, and the means to be able to, to go on my own, be an entrepreneur and set forth a journey of my own. So I did. And it was, it's not easy. You know, I'd never built a business before, but I found that uh, this is going to sound a little reductive, but honestly, a lot of the things that I do in my life, I set it down to, you know, a simple checklist in the sense that you just, you find out like wedding planning, event planning is a similar thing. That's the way I describe it to my couples as well, who get kind of flustered about the whole process. But a lot of things in life is just, you just, you just, go through the steps, you know, okay. So first off to build a business, you know, you, you register the business name, you build a website that represents you, you, you know, you, you, uh, you know, you get all your legals in place, you get some bookkeeping going, you, you tick all these boxes, you get an invoice template, like you just get all these things in place and you do it right. Cause there's a lot of people in this industry, particularly in the wedding game who do it wrong. They don't have service agreements. They don't do invoices. They do cash under the table. They don't report their, their fight, their money yep. to the, to IRS slash the ATO here in Australia. They don't, you know, they don't do all those right things that end up binding them in the butt later on so we, if you by doing all those things correctly and not trying to stick it to the government man you know you end up like being able to build a very robust reputation just by doing it right to begin with but then on top of that it's then just about activating a network so in my particular niche and industry, it's all about the relationships you have. So yes, as much as of course, it's about my skill and talent and that definitely sets me apart from other people, but there's certainly that extra element, which I may be the most talented, like, you know, the, the common trope, the, the most common, the, the most talented musician there is out there, but yet that artist can never get signed because they don't have a good personality and can't, you know, connect with an agent or something like that. You know, it's the same thing. You need to be able to be out there. People need to know you, you need to network, you need to socialize. You need to grind those gears in terms of, of being out there and, and treading carpet until you find the, you know, your white, your, the net is as wide as possible so that you have opportunities coming from, from you from all different directions and you're nurturing the opportunities that have already presented themselves in the past. So my main strategies basically have been A, do it right from the very beginning. B, set up foundational pillars of, of a brand voice and reputation from, from day one and capitalize upon that and grow and consolidate that at every single opportunity I have along the way. And three, once I've taken to, care of those two things, I then set up as wide a funnel as, as possible through a, 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 as wide of a network as I can. So I'm talking entertainment agencies to preferred ven, uh, vendor lists for venues and other um, suppliers that I have got network relationships with to going to networking events. And, you know, like yesterday, I was just at a networking event, um, it was a, an event industry at, and I met a lot of different venues and I was just like, for the ask, I was just like, can I be on your list? Can I send you some details? So not being afraid to have the ask and just establishing those connections from day one. And now uh, I've got 
a, a huge net and I'm still building that net. So then I can then weather when, you know, if, if I'm not able to get, if, if it's a, if, for instance, like economic conditions right now, where the, the tap's not running very, very, you know, hot, at least I'm still able to catch as many drips out of that tap as possible because my net is so far and wide. And so, but that takes time, takes energy, it takes the ability to socialize and to open your mouth and say hello. Uh, but there, it is a lot simpler than what people think it is. The value of networking is something that, I don't think a lot of people grasp, you know, it, it seems like what's the point, even if it's something that may seem unrelated, you know, this is just an event where people are getting together, drinking, uh, doing something. And it's like just being in the same room with certain people and meeting people, not being afraid to, you know, possibly waste your time by showing up and being there. The relationships you build can be invaluable and just send you to new places you never thought. I mean, you never know who you're going to shake hands with in that room and who's going to be happy to meet you. Very true. But when it comes to your job specifically, you know, first of all, what is it that a master of ceremonies does, you know, and maybe even a good one. (laughs) Um, But as a follow up question, what is it that you do? And I know that seems like it may be the same question, but obviously what I'm asking here is, you know, what is the job? And then what is it that you do that is so special and sets you apart? Yeah, great question. So generally speaking, a master of ceremonies is the host of a particular event or gathering. Uh, May it be a wedding to a conference to a uh, garland night, awards evening, a festival, anything where you have a central person who's meant to be the face and sort of voice of a particular event or public gathering. Uh, the, the general expectation for, for MCs, uh, people who are able to be confident on the microphone, be able to make engaging and exciting and, uh, you know, connecting, uh, announcements and, uh, have good pros, uh, are confident when they speak on the microphone can, uh, you know, good at being able to, they've got some level of improvisational flair to them. They definitely have a personality because that you, I need, I, I say those things to distinct them from what I call professional announcers of information because you, you and I'm sure many of your listeners have been to like weddings, for instance, is where this seems to be really rife where, but even in corporate events too, where it's done in house, like, you know, the CEO or someone else, like the marketing girl gets lackeyed with having to do it. Where, you know, you have someone who is paid slash not paid in a professional setting to be the one to talk on the microphone to say certain things that need to say in order for procedural things to take place, such as we're now going to have dinner or the next speaker is, or please welcome our keynote speaker or something like that. That is separate. That sort of professional announcer of information is very separate to an MC, which is meant to be the host of hosts. And many years ago, those people were people who would always go around the room and they would socialize and connect and shake hands. And they were the energy and the vibe and the personality of the night. And when they were announced on stage with the big high energy intro, which I have my, one of my own as well, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like they were brought on as like, you know, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host and masters. Like it was, it's this moment that people go, Oh, you know, and it's why, for instance, like, the best way I can describe it is like how, how people respond to say how, like say Jimmy Kimmel does the, the hosting for the golden globes. I think he does. I don't watch any of those uh, things. Me either. But, yeah. <laughs> but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Like, so when, you know, like how at least the tabloids, you know, go crazy over a really good host, like Ricky Gervais, for instance, always does a great job versus someone. Oh, who he's amazing. A, yeah. So versus someone who does like a really poor job or something like that is the best way I can describe sort of on mass about how, a good the difference between like a good MC and a bad MC. There's an expectation that comes along by being the face and the energy and vibe of the night. Me personally, to the second part of your question, I obviously the cruise ship background, as I mentioned before, is a big point of difference. And so we are just sort of, we're just built different. We, we trained different. We, uh, we were entertaining, you know, you're kind of thrown in the deep end. Uh, when I, when I came up that gangway in, in LA on January 3rd, 2015, you know, you get, yeah, you get in and you meet your deputy cruise, well, deputy cruise director at the time is now, uh, 
different uh, structure, but you meet your you meet your supervisor and you get in and uh, you you get told, okay, so here's your paperwork and you've got all this flurry of stuff you got to sign and here's your uniform. I'm going to take you down here and you know you're taken through all the career areas you're not supposed to be if you have been a guest before. So you're kind of like you know, well, this is great. And then you get your uniform and they say, right, you've got about an hour to like relax and meet your new roommate and then. Out you go and you're now representing the company with a badge and off you, you know, and good luck. You know, obviously it's a bit more than that and you get, you know, you, you do get helped along the way. But certainly there's a, a lot of the deep end approach where you're, you're thrown into having to entertain, you know, immediately hundreds of people at a time in a lounge straight away. And so it's, and you can't hide from it. There's no ability to just shy away. As you know, personally, you seek out the crew staff. You want to know who they are. You want to know these personalities because you know that they're going to give you back a really great experience. So because of that sort of all encompassing, you know, uh, uh, nature of, of the beast when it comes to what I, the environment that I was immersed in, I just, I love sort of like immersing myself now in the moment. So for instance, a big point of difference for me is that like a corporate events, for instance, when a lot of MCs out there will just go to the green room, they won't integrate, they won't come to bef mixes beforehand and so forth. I tell my clients, I'm going to be there. And they're kind of like, really? Like, sure. I'm like, yeah, no, I love that stuff. Like I want to be there early anyway. And I want to meet your people. The reason is, it's because when you interact with those guests beforehand, they then res resonate when you walk out on stage because they know that they had a connection with you. They don't know who I am beforehand. Maybe, okay, sure, I'm on the flyer or something, particularly depending on what kind of event it is. But realistically, unless they look me up, which most people don't, you know, they're busy. And I don't, okay, I'm not a celebrity. I don't care. But because I've connected with them, they go, oh, there's that guy that I was just talking to and he seemed really fun. So yeah, I'll listen to him. And so what it does, it really elevates the experience because I can actually just get straight to the, hey, you're listening to me? Fantastic. Great. Let's get on with it. Compared to coming out and being like, love me. You know, you got to love me. You got to respect me. I'm the MC. I was announced as the MC. So love me. Like it's an arrogance that I find is, is, is a little bit within industry and industry at the moment where it's, it's, it's the expectation that audiences should appreciate you. Whereas on cruise ships, you never take that for granted. And uh, granted, I've worked with some that did take it for granted. <laughs> um, but the best ones out there that I learned from were the ones that were capable of realizing you had to really give a lot before you got back. And that is what I love. I also have a lot of uh, improvisational games and activities that I offer as part of my, uh, part of my, my particular wedding package, but also for my corporates. I do a couple of corporate dinner parties and other bit other sort of headline entertainment where I have game shows that have incorporated from ships and so forth that work really well because again, cruise ship life teaches you how to make something out of nothing and improvisational low tech entertainment that just brings people together and it makes people interact with one another in a really sort of intense sort of, you know, moment is just unreal. Um, and thirdly, it's, it's an attention to detail from my perspective. I, for instance, I really care about, you know, what I'm wearing, uh, for an event, uh, obviously not looking better than the groom, but looking better than the guests. If it's a wedding, if it's a corporate event, well, you know, I'm definitely going to shine. Um, you know, or if there's a costume party, I'm all in for, including makeup and everything else. Uh, there is, you know, there's an attention to detail in terms of, you know, helping out with the event structure. I'm also a professional event management, event manager and stage manager. So I know the back end of a enterprise as well. So I know what the production teams, the AV teams are expecting to get optimally through an experience when they're trying to call a show. And so I am able to respect that and talk their language and I'm able to get much more to down to the crux rather than coming in and just sort of being pushed and prodded and so forth as, you know, like go this way, go that way, which I I do with other MCs when I'm the stage manager and I'm working with someone else on a different gig. So yeah, those are some, you know, unique pillars about me, but uh, overall it's just, you know, a passion that really does burn quite brightly when I go on stage. It's uh, it's an experience that I love to bring to other people. I love to just bring that energy to other people because they deserve it. You know, events can be a little boring sometimes. And so I like to just tell people straight out of the gate, not going to be a boring one today. You've got me. I've had a few of those events where I show up and I'm like, man, this is going to be terrible. You know, I know this group of people. I, I DJed at my niece's wedding and even she was saying like, yeah, 
people probably aren't really going to be dancing and enjoying themselves and having a whole lot of fun. It's probably going to be dinner, get some of the normal events out of the way, and then the night will probably end pretty early. And when she left a review for the company, she was like, I don't even know what to say. Everybody was partying from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Not what we expected. They just had fun. And, you know, I think it kind of ties into something you were talking about at the beginning of, especially in this industry, there's anyone who can, can get up on stage. Anybody can get on stage, get in front of a microphone and make those necessary procedural announcements. This is what's going to happen. This is what we're doing now. You know, take your seats, turn off your phones, all of those things. It's super easy to do. Why do I need a professional? Mm -hmm. You know, and then it's the same thing for a DJ. It's like, oh, well, I mean, I can just put a Spotify playlist on and it's basically the same, Mm -hmm. you know, or an auctioneer, you know, auctioneering is big here in Texas. And it's like, well, I can get up in front of people and just say, hey, I've got this thing here that I'm (laughs) selling and we're taking bids at this amount. And who wants to bid more than that and just ask? And it's like, yes, you're absolutely correct. Anyone can do all of those things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can do them pretty decent. You know, maybe they should look into a career for it. But a lot of the times Mm. you can maximize what you're getting by paying for a professional. You know, with an auctioneer, it's hard because it's like, look, you can have somebody stand up at a charity and try to sell these things. and You're going to fetch some good money for it. But if you have a professional auctioneer, they're going to get you a whole lot more money than what you would get by yourself, you know, and I see that here in the entertainment industry, especially with weddings and corporate events, it's the same, you know, as you said, having that comfort to get on the microphone and make an announcement and announce something procedurally that is also sounding pretty exciting where people want to listen, they want to do what it is and they're enjoying the way that it's being presented. It's like paying for a professional truly makes that difference. Do you want people to enjoy their time, have fun, loosen up because not everybody likes to be thrown in a room with a hundred other people Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden sit there and not know each other and have to have fun together. But it takes a special person that can make all of those people comfortable. All of them open up and do things and say things that they probably never would have before. Only the reward for you as a bride and a groom or as a CEO Mm -hmm. or whomever else is running this show is you get pictures and videos that you would have never gotten before of people having fun in ways that they would have never imagined. Absolutely. Because it's like, holy crap, who knew Danny from accounting was going to put on, you know, two to go plates and uh, or three to go plates and then run around the whole room flapping his wings, you know, saying he's a chicken <laughs> and making chicken noise. It's like, how did you get this guy to do that? And it's like, because I know how to smooth talk my way into getting anyone to do anything that I want, no matter how embarrassing, how fun or how uncomfortable it is for them. And they're going to enjoy themselves. And y'all are all going to leave here with more memories than you ever would have if you just had, you know, Dan from accounting pop up and say, okay, guys, it's time to eat now. So uh, buffet's (laughs) over there. You know, I mean, this is, it's an important thing to talk about. I find it funny too, like, because that X factor is what's really missing from a lot of events. You know, that what you mentioned is that that person that can smooth talk, can uh, really look people in the eye and say, I'm going to make you, you know, do the chicken dance, whether you believe it or not. And like, I've done that, you know, countless times in my career. And I love those feelings when I get back, get into the car at the end of a night. And that's the moment I, I then sort of, people say to me, oh, how do you have so much energy? I said, look, I bring it all, like literally everything that I have in my batteries until I get into the car. And then I slump down and you don't see this. I don't need you to see this, but I, you know, I take my jacket off and that's when I have my first like breath for myself. Um, and I'm okay with that because that's just sort of my DNA from the cruise ship time. And I know that my, my audience deserves that, that, you know, from me. It's funny because I find that that X factor is the part that's really missing from a lot. And why I, 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 I do not understand why companies in particular, but also brides and grooms too. I don't understand why people are comfortable with not having the X factor as part of their presentation. May it be the, the reputation that's put forward with a, say at a conference or perhaps at a, at a wedding where a couple wants to be able to celebrate the, the happiest day of their life. I do not understand why they would rather put that in the hands of somebody who honestly, I could realistically, if uh, my, my main yardstick is this, if I can replace whatever you intend, whatever that person is you've chosen instead, instead of me, if I can replace them 
with an AI voice and just rec- pre-record all the stuff that they would have to say that I know they're going to say because there's not going to be any flair, energy, excitement or, you know, performance like I would bring. If I can sit there and rec- record all of that, send it to the DJ and say, don't worry about the MC, just play these and uh, the night will, you know, please sit down, speech is about to start, welcome the bride and groom, whatever, you know, regular stuff like that. If I can replace that, then you, you, you're not going to have a good night. That's not something that makes any sense. So it's, it's, it's interesting that that story you mentioned about, you know, your niece, because it is, it is that really that X factor that really takes over a particular event that makes it memorable, makes it exciting. I tell all my couples, for instance, when I, before I booked them, I say, you want a wedding where people are going to come to you for years upon years and tell you that yours is better than the rest of them out there and that they remember and they talk about it because being able to reflect upon it is actually really flattering compared to say, uh, you know, your photos and videos, don't get me wrong, go get photos and videos, of course. But no one's coming to your house three years down the line and saying, I, you know what, I just need to, I just had this desire. I woke up this morning and I need to see your photos and your videos. Like no one does that. And yet people are spending thousands on that experience. And I'm not, again, I'm not putting it down. Spend whatever you want on capturing those photos and videos. In fact, please do, because it means then I get the opportunity to get that content too. So please do. But you know, I'm able to share in great memories. Of course, it's my job to create those lasting memories as part of the photos and videos. Please do that. But you're right. Those memories and those that extra little secret something, the spice on the top doesn't come from something that I can replace with AI, something that I can literally just hand a card and say, say this, and then hand it to the brother who's, you know, terrified and almost peeing his pants for having to do it. Like, it... <laughs> It's, it's, it's incredible. It's and people say, Oh, he's so brave for doing it. It's like, how's that brave? Like you've, in fact, you've made someone who is totally terrified, not enjoying their experience. You may be at the corporate function or at the wedding, for instance, making this person do something. They're not able to enjoy the function, even though they've been invited along. They're, 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 they're doing something that I can get maybe they're interested in doing, maybe they're not, but when they didn't realize how much it would be a responsibility once they're in the moment. And then of course there's that that extra pressure of, oh my God, I've got to make sure this is the best day of their life. I've got to make sure this conference, I don't want to lose my job, et cetera. Like, why would you put that pressure on someone's shoulders when you can get someone who not only like myself who can do all that as a minimum, but then obviously elevate above the expectations regardless. It just, it doesn't seem like it's smart money spending. Uh, and, and it definitely is an investment that people can rely on will be a good one. And I've seen some great MCs out there in the American market. In fact, you know, there are a lot of people that I got on my radar that I love to watch just because, you know, they sit very, the, 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 the money and the, the enterprise in the States, having been in that market for a long time is great. And and the USA does events much better than Australia does. And I'm not afraid to say that events in Australia are quite boring. I'm not saying that our country is boring, just we have a very sort of a, a lesser standard. And so I'm part of sort of a, a, a an alumni of sorts in this industry where we're focused on in the greater sphere in the event production world as well. I've got a lot of colleagues within the event industry. We're trying to put together stuff that is really challenging the status quo. So that's sort of speaking for my country, but, you know, it's, it's about setting the bar higher and higher and higher each time. Don't have the same wedding that you've been to before for your own. Don't have the same cor- corporate conference or gala night or awards night that was done before. Don't put your colleagues or your family members in a position where they're terrified or they're not really keen and they just want to have a good time. Get someone like me and I promise, I, it's bad. And it's, they say it's bad to make promises in business. I don't care. I promise you all that your next event, if you pick the right person, will be far better than you ever anticipated. It's little things too. You know, that's the the big thing that I try to get across to people when I'm talking to them about a wedding in particular is oftentimes entertainment is one of the very first things that gets cut from the budget. You know, they say, well, all right, I need a good photographer. I need a good videographer. I need amazing food. Mm -hmm. And then I want to have an open bar and then I want the venue to be nice. Well, now we've overspent. And so I need to save somewhere. Let me get a really cheap DJ. So let me pay $200 $200 or $400 for this DJ that's going to DJ for four or six hours. And it's like, 
that's awesome. And there are some people out there that are just killing it in this industry that have very low prices. I was one of them for a long time. I was hungry for work. Mm. I wanted any gig I could get my hands on. So it was, you know, truly like a hundred dollars an hour is what I was charging. Yikes. And I was doing okay, but yeah, yikes. It's mm. like, how can you really pay all of your bills, pay your taxes, Come. have all the marketing supplies and needs that you need? It, you can't. Yep. You're relying on people who are cutting corners themselves. And I'm like, the most important part of your wedding is entertainment because if mm. it's boring, people leave. They don't need a good reason to leave. It's just what it is. <laughs> they're already After wanting dinner, to leave before gone. they even get there. That's, the, that's right. the part that people don't get. It's like, and I'm not, and I say this with love and kindness, but to be honest, the amount of, when I'm around talking with people, I'm literally the fact that I'm there engaging with guests before we've even started during the pre reception canapes and so forth. The, the fact that I'm there engaging with guests is already keeping people longer because they're going to stay for the formalities. People, are, generally speaking, you know, there's outliers, of course, but 95% of your guests are interested and obviously respect you enough that they'll stay to put money in your wishing well, be there for your entrance, listen to your speeches. But I can tell that when, when, when something's sort of, you know, when I can tell the ones that are keen just to sort of see when the formalities are there and so they can get home. And it's like, they're so interested at the start because they don't know me. They don't know I'm actually we're in for a really good night. You know, they're like, oh, so when's the next thing happening? What's happening? What's happening? And then all of a sudden I, I go, ah, don't worry. I've got a game. And they go, a game? Weddings don't have games. And they go, mine do. And then all of a sudden they go, oh, okay, this is actually not too bad. And then all of a sudden they're staying, they're enjoying, they're going, oh, I have a boogie on the dance floor. Why not? And then I've got something else during the dance floor as well. And, you know, lo and behold, they're there the entire night. They're there during the spark of their exit. And they're like, oh my God, this best thing in the world. And they go home happy and, and, and content. That they actually engage that time because you're right. People would much rather go home, take the suit off, take the dress off and get into comfy pajamas and watch whatever crap they're watching on Netflix. So like, and, and that's just a fact these days, people are much more happier in their home environment if they're not presented with a better opportunity outside of it. And so it's about just bringing the heat to, to your fellow families and, and friends so that you're, you're and respecting your guests and for conferences and for, for corporate events, you know, it's another level of itself. You know, your brand reputation sits upon the, the opportunity to, to make it make it to make a break opportunity to show people that you're an innovative industry, you're a company, you're an, you're a, an exciting uh, brand to be aligned with. And it's really not that hard. Yes. You need to get the food, right? Yes. The music needs to be, of course, you know, on point, blah, blah, blah. But if you don't have an exciting experience to really tie it all together and you're not willing to go the extra mile, then I, I'm sorry, but it's going to be really hard to differentiate your event from somebody else's. And if that doesn't bother you, that's okay. I respect that. That's totally fine. That's actually a okay to have that perspective as well. But if it does matter to you that the several thousands of dollars that you're spending is going to be forgotten consider easy investments such as an MC as a host who can really bring that energy and vibe that other people just don't have. So it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. It, 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 I, I, I wish more people thought it, like you and me, John, cause uh, <laughs> I know cause it doesn't take much to set you apart. You know, I think that generally speaking, the bar is so low for so many events across the world every day that just the little things of, having a special song queued up during the bouquet toss or the garter toss. And then, you know, playing into that and gamifying that, let me get a chair to the dance floor for the bride. And then when that comes in, you know, calling the bride out there in a special way and just having kind of that rapport with the audience where you're talking, you're laughing, you're having fun, you're cracking jokes, you know, for me as a DJ playing some soft MC skills into it, hmm. you know, it's, it's bringing up two songs, you know, an NSYNC song over here, for those millennials that I'm DJing for, and then a Backstreet Boy song over here, and then having Classic. the crowd participate in choosing, you know, all right, who was team NSYNC and who was team Backstreet Boys? You know, what song is going to play next? Like you get to interact and make that decision. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between me and a CD player. Oh, you yeah. know, that's the difference yeah. between you and an AI voice is mm -hmm. someone that is going to be truly interactive and give you a reason like, Everyone loves music and they want to hear it. And sometimes you'll have those people 
you know, uh, my aunt Rhonda was one that was going to have fun at every event that she ever went to, no matter what, it didn't matter if the DJ sucked, the MC sucked, if the lighting was bad, the food was terrible. She was going to be out on the dance floor dancing. You're going to have those people. But if you want that same mentality to be infected into everybody that's at that event with you, Mm. then you need somebody who truly can connect with them and make them have fun. It's almost like you, you know, you got to force them to do it because again, like you said, the most comfortable thing for them is going home, taking off those uncomfortable formal clothes, (laughs) getting into their pajamas, turning on Netflix and laying in bed. So if you want them to stay and you want them to have fun and remember it, you know, that's the biggest compliment I can ever get after an event is, you know, Hey, this person called me. I sent them your phone number because they called and said, Oh my God, who was your DJ? Mm. I've got to have him at our wedding. Mm. And it's like, that's the biggest compliment you can get because you know that you made an impact on somebody to the point that they remembered you when they got home and called your bride and groom later, your CEO that, you you know, hired you later. So Mm. definitely exciting stuff, but you're right. You and I, we're nerdy about it. Not everybody is that way. But, you know, the big thing to get across is exactly what you said. If you're planning an event and you want it to be memorable, you want it to be fun because uh, who doesn't? Like, why do you want to have a wedding and be bored the whole time? That sucks. You know, Mm -hmm. my wedding, we were there till two o'clock in the morning because we were partying and having fun. Like, that is the goal. Yeah. I want people to have fun and be there. And if that matters to you, 100%. Make sure entertainment is one of the things at the top of your list. Don't cut it. Now, getting more into your company and what you do, yeah. uh, who is it that you are serving? I mean, obviously, you're in Australia. Mm-hmm. That's a huge continent. So there's a lot of space there, a lot of customers there. Yeah. What areas do you serve and who are you looking for as a customer? Yeah. So, of course, I'm I'm on the wedding side of things. I'm looking for engaged, exciting couples who are looking for a truly memorable, you know, unforgettable wedding experience that their guests will talk about for a lifetime. So... Uh, definitely, uh, you know, from, I, I've done guest, I've done count, guest counts from 30 people all the way to 500. So, um, and, and beyond if you had in a thousand, it doesn't matter for me if you to entertain two and a half thousand people on board a ship. So, uh, from any guest count, just, it's more about your personality and your vibe that you're going for. If you're willing to have a night that, uh, that really excites and delights and, sets the stage ablaze and has people really, really remember your special evening, then that's the kind of people that I'm looking for. When it comes to the corporate world, um, pretty broad stroke in the sense that I do pretty much any kind of event except, and I work with pretty much any people. And I know that's kind of, you know, not so great in the business world and I have a, so, 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 such a target, but I mean, is in events are run by several different types of people and organizations. So I've done organizations from NFPs, charities to, uh, you know, I've done major awards nights for big, um, large to international corporations to uh, big festivals, public gathering festivals for local councils to, uh, gee, um, I've done corporate, dinner parties and end of year parties as well. I, I, there's not really a lot that I haven't done. The only thing I probably don't necessarily meh, care for so much is like, say like, like a, like a specific side of type of like sporting event, like, you know, like a football game or something like that. I just, yeah, there's plenty of other people who fit that niche a bit better than I do. Um, but virtually anything else from a conference, a gala evening, a charity night, etc. there's not really a lot that I've not done slash, you know, it's not in my wheelhouse or I'd like love to be able to do. And of course, I'm always prepared to travel. I, I tell people that uh, if the if the wedding or the corporate event is in Antarctica, you just got to pay the travel and I'll, I'll go. So uh, having, you know, traveled all around the world anyway and entertained over 40 plus nationalities, it's definitely not uh, unfamiliar to me to engage with other people of uh, from different cultures to literally physically being in other parts of the world. So I'm I'm constantly looking for companies that are innovative, on the edge, looking for something different. I actually just this morning had a uh, a really cool uh, thing come in via a, a a colleague of mine who I've worked with in the past. She started a new entertainment agency of her own. She's a fantastic uh, DJ here in Australia and. And uh, she is looking for a someone, uh, an experience to put in for an, a gala awards evening for a game show 
element for a 20, 30 minute game show experience that really set the night apart. And she's like, I thought of you because I know that you're great at coming up with new concepts, but if you got something off the shelf, we can do that too. And that was that's really exciting. So I'm looking forward to ideating at that out because that's the kind of company that is really willing to set it apart and not just get, look, no, no disrespect, but not just willing to just get like, you know, like a, a hypnotist or a magician or, you know, or do some sort of dance act or something that's always just always been done. If you're looking for something new, fresh, exciting, innovative, you know, I'm the ideas guy. I'm the guy that will, will come to the table and do something that is fresh and unique and really set your brand apart. So I'm, that's, that's the kind of area that I love working within. You know, I mean, to be fair, the last corporate event that I was in charge of when I was the director of operations for a private ambulance firm here in Houston, uh, I had a magician and a dance act. OK, so it wasn't one or the other. It was both. All right. So give me some credit there. <laughs> yes. But uh, I will tell you, adding games to it, you know, as someone who doesn't necessarily specialize in the game show side of things myself, I DJed that event just to cut some money off of that, uh, that budget as well, because, you know, it's easy to throw a big corporate event for several hundreds of people and spend 12, 15, $20,000. So mm-hmm. trying to save some money, I DJed it myself and, and we did some really fun stuff in addition to that. But this whole game show thing being added into a corporate event does sound like a lot of fun. I mean, you know, sitting on the cruise, when you get called back into the, you know, the big auditorium, the big theater that's on board, every single one of them. It is a lot of fun when you're watching these newlywed game shows and, Mm -hmm. you know, all these different game shows that are there to bring people out of the audience, put them on stage and just thrust them into the fun by putting them in the spotlight. You know, so why not do something like that here with either a wedding or a corporate event like and that's I do. different and it's innovative. I do. I have two games that I've brought directly from uh, for weddings that I brought directly from the cruise ship. So you mentioned the newlywed game. I've actually got a version of that. I, uh, and the marriage match game, as I call it. Uh, and I've adapted for weddings. So it involves just obviously one couple rather than the three, cause that would take forever. Um, but uh, it's a really great game uh, in, in, in my mind, actually it's a better game than the shoe game, which has been kind of overdone now. I still do it constantly because it's a safe game for people to pick because they've seen it before. So they sometimes don't like picking beyond what they've seen before and that's fine. But uh, when I have couples that are willing to to sort of go the extra mile and do something that's a bit different that no one else will see, the marriage match game really works well. It's very fun, noise canceling headphones, the questions are a bit, a bit more risque, <laughs> you know, kind of things, very, very fun. Um, there's another game too that I've adapted that I've called, it's a new game actually called Love is in the Blank. And it's like, you may have seen this game show on, on ships before. It's, it's like the fill in the blank or the blankety blank game show, uh, where there is a, a, a phrase where there's a suggestive blank missed out, uh, in, in, in the piece. It's all very, you know, PG in the sense that there's nothing bad said, but the blank makes it sound like it's a little bit more, you know, let the comedy run free. And I have the couples with two tablets that they can't see. They're back to back and three meters apart. And they got to write down on the tablet what they think the other person's going to say. Then the audience gets an opportunity to reciprocate and like before they reveal their answers and do that about 10 times. Cool thing too, is I can put like people actually at the wedding in those scenarios. And so it then is that extra connecting experience. That's it's all about bringing the audience into it. So it's not just a TV experience. I gotta hate that. But corporate, uh, one of my signature game shows that I've also brought from the cruise industry. Uh, I don't know if carnival has this game, but princess has this game called the yes, no game show. And it's such a hit for corporate. It's my, my signature piece for corporate. Essentially, uh, it is a game show where I sit down an individual for th- up to three minutes in the hot seat. And the idea is they're not allowed to say while having a conversation with me, the words yes or no. And it is a lot harder than you think. It's really fun because it brings, it gives, it's a massive t- conversation piece because initially it, it sets a lot of bravado in the office, right? Yeah, people that say, oh, I would never be able to do it. And they sort of clock out straight away. But then you have a whole bunch of people that want to impress people. And so these are the kind of people I want on stage because they think that they can win over me with that. And it's not an easy game. 
it's a lot of fun because you can really catch people in, in, in certain different ways. Great when the, the clock's ticking and it's all very, the, the, the lights are on you and it's produced really well as well. It was a delight. I really love doing this game show on Princess. So I'm really, I'm always thrilled when I get an opportunity to do it for corporates because uh, it's a game that they never anticipate being so great. They think, oh, well, I'm just having a conversation on stage and, and that's, that's, that's 45 minutes of a headline show. I'm like, really, Nathan? And I go, no, no, no. Trust me. And so a lot of it is a masterclass in improvisational comedy as well, because it's about my interactions with them and the questions that I ask. But uh, it's things like that that really do set a night apart. That, don't get me wrong. Like I said, I love when I work with other talented artists out there. I just am always always encouraging corporates to not just lean on the same stuff that they do all the time, have a different night to the previous evening that they did last year. And yes, you're right. As you said, incorporating multiple elements to make up the whole, not just, Oh, we'll get another magician this year. Oh, we'll just get another, you know, singer act or something like that. Like really craft an experience that's around it being different and new from the last time and elevating it from the last experience that's all I could ever ask people to do, you know, to really make events great out there. I love it, man. I, I think that it's something that we've kind of seen before in bits and pieces, but not all together. You know, it's not truly, like you said, your unique set here is bringing that game show host and cruise director mentality to something that you wouldn't necessarily think you would see that in all the time. And it, it does, it creates something new, innovative and fresh. So I think it's amazing. Are you sharing any of this stuff to social media, your website? Like, where do I need to go to connect, see you reacting real time in, you know, on these videos and know if you're a good fit to be a part of my event? Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, uh, my, my, my sort of the, 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 Top of my portfolio is my website at Nathan Kassar, C A S S A R.com.au, where you can find all of my past work. I'm currently updating all my 30 plus galleries and counting. It takes forever when you're by yourself. Uh, but I have uh, on my YouTube page as well, which is the main link there, uh, has some of my headline uh, uh, showreel content and past work that I've done. I'm constantly updating that as well. And I've got some really great fire videos I've just uh, released recently of an awards night I did and uh, other ga the games that I do at weddings and so forth are also on there. My big high energy intros and all that. I do a bit of virtual work too. So I'm always available for remote work if anyone's interested. I do host, I've hosted and always open to host uh, virtual conferences and keynotes, uh, sort of uh, conferences and so forth. So always open to all of that. I, I've got an MC masterclass that I'm beginning, I'm hoping to roadshow soon and happy to adapt for uh, both virtually and in person. Always open to international work in the sense of you feel that I could really bring a difference to a difference to your event coming up and you're willing to, uh, to bring me over to the States or to Canada. I, I understand the market, live there. I know how to make a, an American crowd, North American crowd sing. So, uh, literally <laughs> made them sing. So I uh, would love to entertain that idea as well. You can follow, like and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. All my main links are on my, uh, my website at the top and the bottom and uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well under Nathan Kassar and Nathan Kassar Master Ceremonies. Would love to connect with anybody. Send me an email. I've, I've received emails all the time from people just asking for general advice and I'm happy to jump on a call and I'm not going to charge for that. But I just uh, would love to be able to, if you have any new ideas sparked from this as well, always, always looking for new opportunities. And if there's any way that I can personally bring that unique flavor, send me an email uh, uh, give me a call if you have an international phone plan. That'd be cool. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to uh, set up a time to chat and uh, see what I can do for you. I can't wait to check it all out. And, you know, of course, our listeners in the show notes, you'll find all of those links that were just talked about. That way they can connect with you nice and easy by just clicking that stuff, going directly to it. And, man, if you get one of those gigs here in Texas, you're going to have to give me a call and let me know. That way I can make my way over there and somehow get an invite or at least meet up with you and meet you in person. You've I, got an infectious personality. I love oh, it. thank you. I, I have a lot of people, including yourself, that I'd love to catch up with in Texas. I've got a lot of family and friends, um, or I consider them my family, I should say, my, my cruise ship family from over there. I've got, it's a blessing when you work in an international environment like that to have people all around the world who still, still fondly talk about and, and reminisce over the time that I spent with 
with them to give them a lasting memory while on a ship. So I've got a lot of people in Texas. I found uh, you guys to be some of the most fun and energetic and, and involved people when I was on board. Uh, you guys also just love to cruise. So I met a lot of Texans while I was on board. So oh, yeah. got, a love, got a lot of love for you guys and uh, would, uh, would be in my absolute pleasure to, to hopefully be back over there. It's been, uh, yeah, been some time since I've been to the States. So would love to go back. Sydney is is one of my bucket list travel uh, travel wishes. Like that's definitely somewhere I want to go. Uh, you know, ever since, and I know that this is probably just so like stereotypical and played out. But as a kid, man, the crocodile hunter was like that was my show. You know, just <laughs> watching him, the way that he interacted with wildlife, and then of course the accent has always. And I know I have an accent, according to you. You have one according to me, but you know, it's always intrigued me. It's been, it's such a cool accent. It seems like such a cool place to go. My kids are huge fans of bugs and wildlife. Uh, we actually, someone I had on the show wrote a book for children about traveling to Australia because oh, she wow. just travels the world all the time. And so she wrote this little book about these travel rangers and this was her first one. It's an interactive book. So whenever you scan with your phone, if you have the app downloaded, which comes with the purchase of the book, if that's the version you bought, then when you're looking, you're actually looking inside of, you know, whatever it may be, the ocean with these different fish and, and yep. wildlife inside of it, or, you know, videos of a kangaroo crossing the road, or, you know, all of these different places that you can go in Sydney. They've got the harbor, the bridge, and you know, the opera house and all of these things that you can see on your phone, either with videos, pictures, and it's like augmented reality. So mm -hmm. whenever you're moving your phone around and looking at these things, you may see a video of fish. You may see uh, just a 3D model of the entire Sydney Harbor in one place that you can kind of interactive look and see with people walking across the bridge. And, you know, she just kind of tells the story of these differences between Australia and here. And one thing I found the more people I talk to is that Texans and Australians, I think, have more similarities in common than we even know. Mm. So definitely somewhere I want to go and check out and travel to and just get to know that culture and, you know, what it is y'all have to offer. So if I'm ever in town, Please I will do. have to hit you up there as well. But thank you for coming on and sharing your story, man. It's it's exciting to me. You know, I still I have imposter syndrome about what we're doing here on this show. And to know that I've been able to connect with people worldwide and tell stories of people from outside of my country, even further of a view than I originally had for this show. It's amazing that people are willing to get on here and share such a different side of the world. I mean, literally, look what time it is there compared to how late it is here right now. Uh, it, it's a totally different side of the world, man. But yet here we are with commonalities and we can talk and enjoy each other's company. And I just appreciate you taking that time. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. It's a real joy to be able to always love uh, interacting with people across the world, particularly my brothers and sisters back over in my uh, former residence in the, in, in the United States. So I really appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity to share my story here. It's uh, one of passion, one of, uh, I, I, since uh, one that just sparked off a, 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 off the back of a dream to be a cruise director. And it, I never had anticipated it would be as, as vibrant as a career as it has been so far. I'm just really impassioned for the future and what I can bring to people's lives to just bring smiles to people's faces. I think that's really where it comes to when I, I'm just grateful that uh, you have a platform that is uh, drawing people in my, my, like myself as well to be able to share it. So cheers to you. And uh, I hope you get to make your way down here. Would love to entertain you here in Sydney. It's truly my pleasure to have you on. And I know that I will eventually. So I will definitely hit you up when I get there. And listeners, whether you're listening in the States, in Canada, in Australia, or somewhere else throughout the world, I do want to have more people on from wherever it is that you represent. So please head over to smallbusinessorigin.com. Check out the show, all the episodes we have. You can connect directly with me by leaving a voicemail or even going on and shooting me an email through the contact us page. If you have somebody you want to have on, please send them our way. Even though we have all of these episodes already lined out and ready to go until next year, I would still love to add yours into the queue and maybe even start releasing some more than just once per week. So interact with the show, like, follow, share, all of those good things. We always ask for a good review. But of course, the best thing that we can ask for is for you to tune in every single Thursday for a new episode. And on that note, that's what it's been for us. Another episode, another great entrepreneur. We're done for this week. We'll see you on the next one. And as always, stay beefy, my friends.
Thanks for listening to another episode of Small Business Origins. I love an origin story. If you like what you just heard, leave us a review, subscribe, and share with a friend. You guys, check this out. They're going to love it. You're going to love it. 